Hey, welcome to Fitz Dog Radio. I'm very happy to see you. Welcome into my world. I'm sitting in the uh, back house in the bonus room. I got a bunch of clothes hung behind me from when Aunt Jo passed in the Bronx, and my wife decided to uh, get some clothing. It's hanging back there with no plan. There's no, uh, there's not a lot of closet space left in the house because the uh, my daughter and wife have already filled theirs, their allotment, and now we've got hanging clothes that smell like mothballs, but are very. Uh, very, very fashionable. It was the 1950s. So I guess they're vintage. I don't know if they're going to sell them or what. But anyway, we're here. Thanks for joining me. I've got a great guest today, Greg Garcia, who's a guy who uh, I just have so much respect for. He's a big showrunner, created a lot of huge shows. We'll talk about that. And we had a real nice talk last week. I am... Um, Hosting in the middle of a lot of hosting. It's August in LA, which is when everybody visits us. We got uh, we had my my son's college roommate Rory came out for a few days. Great fucking kid, music aficionado, intelligent. Um, my my son has good friends. I really so does my daughter. They both have very interesting, uh, cool friends, which I take as a sign that we did a decent job as parents. I think. And uh, then we had my nephew, who's my wife's brother's son, stayed with us with his girlfriend, Alice, which is a fucking badass name for a chick and a badass chick. She's awesome. Uh, You ever meet somebody and you immediately just go like, all right, here's something new and different. She's South African, but kind of a posh South African accent, you know, like a colonist. Uh, but, but a groovy, uh, bro, she's a broken toy, but she admits it. Um, anyway, we, we went to, we did just did a lot of fun shit. We took them on a big walking tour. I made my famous pancake breakfast, which I make for everybody, which has a lot of ingredients in it. And then we did a major walk through Venice, went through the canals down to the Venice pier, walked down it, went to muscle beach, the skateboard park, watched the surfers. Did it all, then walked back through the walk streets and uh, went to Penmar for lunch. Uh, it, was a, uh, it was a drinking lunch for everybody, except for me, of course. And then his brother, Rowan, showed up with his very cool girlfriend uh, a couple days later. And we all went to the beach, threw a football, threw a frisbee, boogie boarded. Um, it's just great. I, I, we love having people. And then uh, tomorrow, my mother comes in. It's her 80th birthday on Wednesday. And she's flying out with my sister, who's coming in from New York. And we're going to do tons of shit. We're going to the Motion Picture Museum, the Oscar Museum. And going to the beach. We're going to uh, Malibu for her birthday night to, uh, I think it's called Neptunes. There's a place right on the beach. You sit outside, watch the sunset, and just hang out. There's a lot of wine. We, we've, we bought eight bottles of wine, so I think we're set for the first couple days. My mom likes to drink red wine, and you can tell when she's had enough, there's a color coding system with her teeth where they turn a darker shade of red by, by the glass, and when they turn purple, it's time to take mom's wine glass away and send her to bed, where she has to listen to books on tape at a very high volume. So it's going to be interesting. She had a, she had a major heart surgery the, uh, almost a year ago, and she's been very slow coming back from it, so we're not going to be able to do as much walking as normal. I made a, I made a tea time at a golf course. I uh, made sure they had a cart for her she's gonna play as much as she can oh i gotta find some more women's clubs damn it um what else oh and then we also had a visit last night we went out to dinner with kevin meany's daughter and his ex-wife marianne kate meany who's wonderful and my daughter's gonna go to the uh hilt to the um beverly hilton tomorrow and go to the pool with kate who's a waitress at the comic strip in new york and is possibly starting a comedy career herself. She's very funny. So we'll see how that goes. 
A um, lot of memorials this week. There was uh, one for Brody Stevens on August 8th, 18th, because that's 818, which was his big catchphrase. He glorified the valley. Nobody else thought the valley was cool except for Brody Stevens. Nobody still thinks the valley's cool except for Brody Stevens. And he celebrated Encino and the 818 for life. And uh, so they had a big day for him, and they revealed a mural that's on a wall. I think it's in Encino. I'm not sure which town it's in. And um, and then George Shapiro, the famous comedy manager, guy who managed Seinfeld and a million big comics, and he was Kevin Meany's manager, which is why uh, Kate flew out here with Marianne to go to the uh, memorial. And I just think, like, when you die, don't you want to... You know you lived right if people have big memorials for you. And I, sometimes I worry that my memorial won't be big enough. I want something big. I got to start reaching out to more people. I got to start telling better stories. I have to start fucking fuck ups. That's what people like to talk about at memorials. The time you got a DUI or you got in a fight at your kid's school. You know, shit like that. Those are good stories. Anyway. Um... Still on fire. My stand-up is strong. You go through waves as a comedian. I think I talked about this last week. And I've been on it. Like, your confidence just builds. And you get really free. And you write new shit. And you feel good. And I'm still going. Still going strong. And uh, I did some abortion jokes the other night. And a woman was yelling out. She yelled out, uh, No uterus, no opinion. At the, at the setup of the joke. I haven't even, hadn't even done the joke yet. And I said, and I, maybe I talked about this already. I think it happened more than a week ago. And I told her, shut the fuck up and hear some abortion jokes. And, and uh, now's the time for them. Abortion jokes. Got some jokes about women's basketball. It's all coming out. Uh, Bill Burke, congratulations to him. Shout out to Bill. Just played two sold out shows at Fenway Park. Are you shitting me? Jesus Christ. So cool. Uh, Happy for him. If you want to see me, hopefully I can sell out The Grove in Lowell, Arkansas, September 16th and 17th. And then New Orleans on October 6th. Lafayette, Louisiana, October 7th. Chicago, the Den Theater, October 15th. Come on out. Tampa, Side Splitters, November 17th through 19th. Also got dates coming up in uh, uh, Dallas, Texas and Philly. Go to FitzDog.com for tickets. All right, a couple quick overheards, and then we'll get going with Greg Garcia. Martin Shaw said, I was on a bench in the local shopping mall waiting for my wife to come out when a young couple walked past me. Girl said, I can still taste that fucking shit in my fucking mouth. Guy says, what fucking shit? Girl says, that fucking shit sauce from Yo Sushi. It's fucking shit. (laughs) Oh, the poetry of the American mall. There it is, like a haiku. And I wouldn't go to a mall to get sushi and expect anything less than shit sauce, lady. What were you expecting? A delicate melange of of ginger and and uh, some type of a... Uh, what, what, what did you want? Shark fin? What did you think you were going to get at the fucking mall? He didn't say where they were. I don't know where the mall is. Have to let me know. John Lash said, woman at a cash register buying lots of kids' birthday-related items for her granddaughter. The filthy, scrawny, bad tattoo-covered cashier says, quote, I can't believe my daughter is turning 16 this year. Then he follows that up with, and I can't believe I'm turning 29. Let's do some math. He had his daughter when he was 13. Shouldn't this be some sort of PSA for safe sex for kids? Have a kid at 13, look forward to a career at the dollar store. Well, that sounds classist. I mean, look, the dollar store, you're fucking working, people. I don't shit on anybody's job. I, I, I think it's noble to work at a dollar store and do a good job. And you know what happens? Then you get promoted to manager. And now you're a manager of a retail store. And then you work, then you work your way over to the gap. You never know. You got to start somewhere. John Seawick said, two hospital maintenance employees walk by. One says to the other one, so you're saying you wouldn't have a pet monkey, but you would have a pet gorilla. 
Um, yeah, that doesn't make sense. I would not have a pet gorilla. Uh, I, I don't think I'd have a pet monkey either. You hear shit about you, you, people that have monkeys for years, and then one day they fucking snap and chew your face off. Um, I'm, I'm done with pets for a while. My daughter's talking about getting a cat. We'll see about that. We have a lot of allergies in this house. I don't think that's going to happen. And finally, this is an overheard that my guest, Greg Garcia, sent me. He sent me an email after our podcast saying that he's been sitting on this overheard for years. He always meant to send it to me. And here it is. And you'll notice a difference in <laughs> in uh, the level of overheard when you hear his. This This guy is one of the best writers in Hollywood, but this is what he overheard. He goes, and I forgot to tell you my overheard that I've been sitting on for 15 years. I was at the register at the dollar store in North Carolina, another dollar store, and an older guy, 60s, is standing behind me. A young woman comes up to the counter behind him and puts down a pregnancy test. The old dude glances over at the pregnancy test, and then he looks at the woman and in a thick accent says, look like you're fixing to ruin somebody's day. <laughs> Oh, I could say the same thing about a morning after pill. That would definitely ruin somebody's day for life. See, back with the abortion jokes. I can't stop. All right, listen. So my guest, Greg Garcia, is an amazing guy. He is the creator, executive producer of Yes, Dear with Anthony Clark and Mike O'Malley. Uh, my name is Earl. Uh, the guest book, Raising Hope, which was a great fucking show. Should have been on longer. Uh, he also worked on Family Guy, and he, he's done a ton of shit. And he's got a new show we're going to talk about, which is fantastic. And, uh, and here he is, the great Greg Garcia. Uh, welcome to Fitz Dog Studios, Greg Garcia, who is uh, bearded. Is that a pandemic thing? No, I did this like uh, I guess in like in revolt after I did the last four camera sitcom I did. I just wanted to change everything after yeah. that point, and I grew the beard. I think in defiance, and I've kept it. And my wife hates it. Of course, she hates it. Yeah. I, 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 who, I, who wants to kiss somebody with fucking hair all over their face? Not my wife. I'll yeah. tell you that, but. I got into the point where if I grow it enough so it's super unruly, yeah. then when I get it back to this point, she's fooled now into thinking that this is like quaffed and trimmed and everything. But, you know, I, she's not going anywhere. You know, it's been 25 years. You Where's she were going? college sweethearts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's funny. We knew each other in college. I actually dated her friend in college. Okay. And then, uh, and then after college, I got all drunk and I drove through my college town on my way to L.A., told everybody I loved her ended up like waking up in a garage and then like the, <laughs> then we went to lunch and she had a boyfriend but yeah. like I like kept it going and then somehow kept it kept it going people funny they're like they look at each other they'll look at us together and like my wife is very attractive and and they're like oh wait a second you guys met in college so you didn't marry Greg for money and she's like nope she goes I stayed for the money <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the Ray Romano story too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stayed for the money. Stayed for the, the money. The divorce gets too expensive it's, at that point. It's too much. Yeah. I mean, yeah. At this point, as long as as long as I keep producing, I think that she's going to keep me I around. I love it. Yeah. yeah, you need something to get you out of the door in the morning. Yeah. Right? So the beard is not a deal breaker. It's never been about looks. So yeah. Uh, now you're yeah. just fucking with her. Yeah. Like, exactly. Now, hey, yeah. I got another let's show see. on the air. Yeah. Let's see what you can. Let's see what you're going to do. <laughs> well, it's a game of chicken. It's a game of chicken. <laughs> you blinked. I got the beard. You blinked. Yeah, yeah. And you just keep doing. I sometimes I see like these mo. Like take a Harvey Weinstein kind of a guy who almost seems like he puts weight on just to be more repulsive just, to women. I'm gonna job of the hut it and yeah. just show you how powerful I am. Right. You're still gonna. You're still gonna do it. Right. Yeah. A lot of these guys that are just so gross that get into that kind of trouble. Yeah. You just. You think they just lean into it. Yeah. Yeah. I. You know, I don't know what my wife thinks of me at this point. I'm like you. I, I married her before I was had, not that I'm as successful as you are, but like I've had my success. 
I've, you know, I think you can look up there and see. Oh, I see. You know, I see. It's, and those are hard to get made. Are those from China or? Those are from China. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. lead. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, Chinese yeah. lead. Yeah. <laughs> And they, you can stab people with those. I actually had a Tony made for Mike O'Malley because we did this Broadway uh, musical together and it just got crushed by the critics and it was immediately gone off of Broadway, this Jimmy Buffett thing. And so every year on opening, the anniversary of opening night, we send each other gifts. <laughs> and I and I had a Tony made, <laughs> like a perfect replica That's Tony great. made. So yeah, he was pretty excited about Mike it. Mike was uh, one of my most frequent guests I haven't had him on in a while, oh, he's but the he best. used to come on all the time. He's I mean, the he's greatest. so busy now. He's like he's moved into like he still acts on like Snowpiercer and stuff, but like he's got he's got a show uh, on Stars called Heels that he's a showrunner of. He just shot a pilot for NBC that he's a showrunner of. That guy, he's a hustler. Hustler. Well, he start because he started in theater, where you gotta, you know, yeah, you gotta write it, produce it, direct it, get people to fund it. You know, that's how he started. Yeah, and even acting, it's just like you don't know where that next job's coming from, right. so you just keep going. And every time I talk to him, I'm, I get exhausted just talking to him. Yeah, like, I don't know how you're doing all this. So you know him from Yes, Dear, which you did with Mike O'Malley and then my dear friend Anthony Clark. I just talked to Anthony last week. You did? Yeah. Anthony, if people don't know, Anthony Clark is, without a doubt, one of the funniest comedians I've ever seen in my life. And you don't know him because he got success as an actor and then he just said, fuck stand up. Yeah. Stop doing it. And now doesn't do a lot of acting. He's kind of... Gotten into real estate now. He did buy a lot of houses when he was on Yes, Dear, and then I think the market was good, and then he's used that. And look, he's he's hilarious. I've just recently, like before the pandemic, we had a little reunion dinner with the Yes, Dear cast, and I got everybody together, and it was it was the main cast, and then Billy Gardell too, who was on a bunch of episodes. So we all hung out, and Anthony was hilarious yeah. the whole night. Yeah, and yeah. he and he fully admits he wasn't the easiest to work with on that show either. Like he, yeah, was, you could say yeah, that. And he was like, you know, he was. Like oh, I was a pickle, wasn't I? I was a I was a tough pickle, you know. And and but the funny thing was, like during the week, it would be tough, and it's like, oh, come on, Anthony, like you know. And then like one weekend, we went to the final four together, and it was me and him and my father and Nick Swartzen. Wow! And we had a blast. Where'd the, you go? New Orleans. Nice. We had so much. I mean, Anthony in New Orleans, that's yeah, like, right, I right. mean, come on. And so he's a pig and shit. We had the mo most fun. And I'm like, this is great. We've had a breakthrough. We're going to have so much fun on Monday now. We've connected. This is awesome. Monday, he was pissed off yeah. again. <laughs> but, either, but he fully admits it. And he's a great dude. And, and we talked last week. He's been calling me recently. And we've been checking in with each other. And it's just... 20 minutes of just laughing, man. He it's 20 really minutes of laughing. He cracks me up. He is just, he's just silly. He's absolutely silly. And you're both from Virginia, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm from like right around D.C. He's from Virginia, he's Virginia. From yeah, yeah, he's down there. He's yeah. down there. A couple of his cousins like would work on the lot and these guys would like work for the show and stuff or they'd work on Will and Grace and they were like legends on the lot because they yeah. were just these like nutty dudes that were so much fun right. and it's where you got your weed and yeah. they, were, they were nuts like he brought the family in and i said something disparaging about yes dear <laughs> yeah i mean look yes dear say what you want about it that thing was on the air for what six years long time cbs prime time good ratings long six time. years the thing about yes dear that was the only frustrating thing was it became the punching bag, yes, right? It became yes, the fill-in bad show. I mean, I was like six years later, I would read an article in Time magazine about the ancillary rights to Harry Potter, and it would say, Hollywood's in the business of making money, except for, of course, Yes, Dear, but blah, 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 blah. I'm like, where did that come from, right? So, yes, yeah, so you were, so I'm, I was a little sensitive to it. I was a fan of yours. I had met you at um, the guy who co-created uh, the show with me, his Alan funeral. Alan Kirschenbaum. Yeah, I'd met you at his funeral, and I was excited to meet you, and then I was tuning in. Adam Carolla one day and I'm like, ah, it's Fitz Simmons. This is awesome, you know? Like, and then it's whatever conversation you make a joke about yesterday. Yeah. 
And I think it was more. So I sent you an email, and I don't think I was a dick about it. I was just like, oh man, no, I was, was disappointed. Respe- it was respectful, and you you invoked our dear friend's uh, memory. Yeah, which I, I think to was make you feel guilty. Yeah, and I yeah. did, and I did feel guilty. <laughs> <laughs> and you sent a very nice email back, and you said something like, "You're on these podcasts, and you're filling time, yeah. and whatever." I'd sell out my mother if I had to, you know, right. for a joke. And which I totally understood at the time, but I gotta say, and I'm glad I'm here today to say this. I understand it way more now than I ever did back then. Like I did, I did a podcast that that dropped last week with with our friends Tom and Christina. Yeah. And all the t- after I watch, I'm like, oh, I, there's ten people. I hope don't listen to this right. thing. I shit on Jimmy Buffett. I shit right. on all these. And I'm like, oh my god. Of course, like, I felt dumb. And if I'm really being honest, I think it was an excuse because I'm a fan of yours to like have a contact yeah. and reach out. You know, yeah, even yeah. though it was like in a stupid way or uh-huh. whatever. But yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I respected forgiven. it because it was uh, it was firm, but it was fair. And I thought, good for him in a town where people are so afraid to ever start conflict or drama. Good, get it out <laughs> because now I know it's out. And we yeah, and then it's like it I just yeah, it. I just said it, and what the yeah. hell? Like I've always right. kind of been like, just say what you mean, and then just move on. I mean, it wasn't like whatever. It wasn't a big deal or anything. Right. But I'm glad. But can we all, can we talk about Alan for a moment? Oh, absolutely. I mean, Alan Kirschenbaum's father was a comedian out of New York named Freddie Roman, who Legend. was one of the Legend in the Catskills iconic and... Catskill comedians, one of the most uh, uh, charismatic, magical pre- people on stage. He could light it up. And, and when I was a kid, I wanted to be a comedian when I was a kid, when I was a teenager. And so my father, so Freddie kind of mentored me, and I remember seeing him at the... What was the racetrack in Westchester? The Yonkers Raceway. Okay. So I went to the Yonkers Raceway during the day, and Freddie was standing on the fucking track with a microphone while there were about 80 people spread out all over the stands. Yeah. And, and even at 14, I go, this is not good. Yeah. <laughs> so he walks up to the microphone, and, I'm, and he's, got a, <laughs> he's got a fucking tuxedo on. It's July, and he's outside during the day with a tuxedo. And he walks up to the mic and he goes, all right, come on, folks. We're going to do a comedy show. Everybody bring it in tight. Let's pretend we're family. And he makes a big joke out of getting everybody in tight into a square in the front, moves the microphone closer to them, and then rips into 45 minutes of perfect fucking jokes oh, yeah. and destroys. Yeah. And I learned, an more from, I learned more from Alan's father. I used to go up to the Catskills and watch him all the time. He was my sponsor at the Friars Club when I joined, when I moved to New York. So he said, I want you to meet my son. When you, I started to go out to Hollywood for stuff. I want you to meet my son. And uh, Alan, like without missing a beat, met me at a, at a Starbucks in the Valley and started giving me advice. And he'd bring me into writing rooms and... Uh, just the greatest, sweetest guy. Such a great guy, and so much his father's son. He drove a Cadillac. Oh yeah, always a ha- Who always had a Cadillac. a Cadillac. And one day on Yes Dear, he has Cadillac, and we were parked right next to each other. And I was coming in early for editing, and I just took the turn too fast. I just t-boned it yeah. i just completely oh, no. t-boned it and i came into editing and i looked at him and i just started laughing and he goes what i go i hit your car <laughs> and he goes what like c- parking and i go yeah he goes so what it's like a little scratch or something you're parking how fast are you be going i go oh it's bad <laughs> it is bad and we got out there and we were just laughing he never asked me to pay for it he never it was really? just no he yeah, was just like yeah. this is hilarious wow. you're an idiot you know whatever but yeah that cadillac always with the cadillac yeah old yeah. school dude just old school old cigar school. in his mouth yeah everything old school about and him. that guy were you part of down the shore no that okay. was before my time i'd watched down the shore as a fan and then Alan and I because people I, don't know that show was a precursor to Friends everybody always yeah. said I think it only made it on the air for one season starring Lou Schneider who's a writer yeah, but yeah right. he was he was in that as an actor and yeah. I remember watching it on Fox and I was doing a show um, called Getting Personal which was I didn't run it these two guys ran it and I was just working on it and then those two guys had a big breakup in the second season, and they brought in Alan to kind of take the place of one of those guys, and Alan and I kind of ended up running the show together, because the guy that got left, he didn't know what he was doing, yeah. and we bonded over that, and then that's when we decided, hey, we gotta we gotta create a show together, and that's what Yes Dear came out of. Wow. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, so he tragically took his own life, 
Yeah, and, it was. Uh, I never had any insight to that. Was there any? Well, you know, it was at a time where he was big into horse racing. Alan, he right. owned a bunch of horses up like in Sacramento, right? Yeah, he had a he had a uh, farm in Sacramento, and then there was some trouble with the with the horses where he was worried about losing some of the horses, and he carried a lot of guilt about that. And at the same time, Freddie, uh, his father was sick, so that was happening to him at the same time. And he also had a new show that he was doing. Um, with Ajay Sagal, I don't know if you know him, no. but they were doing this show uh, called Friend Me for CBS, which, ever, which they shot him, it never saw the light of day. But he was also struggling with that too, so he had a lot of like stressful things going on in his life at the time, and he had been working with me on Raising Hope, and the only reason he left was because he went to do this other show. Right. And we were talking a lot about, and I knew he was depressed about these three different things, but it was like a three-headed monster, and it was like, which is the thing that is more of it you know and uh so i would go over and try to help him with breaking stories and at one point when i thought oh the show is bringing you this down just quit it man yeah right. just quit walk he away the money come, sure. come back over to raisin hope yeah. you got a job with me come sit back in the room with the writers right. if that would bring you joy walk away from this but i think he was like well that would be like pretty much giving up on his career and whatever but then at one point he did tell me he goes it's the horses it's the horses that you wow. know, he goes, he goes, you know, we're running out of money and I might not be able to feed the horses. And I and go, he started just to give some background to that. He went to UPenn, graduated and then was shoveling shit in horse stables yeah. for years. He that loved horses. He would yeah. ride the chariot. He would ride in those chariot races. Yeah. You know, and I go at that point, I go, dude, if this is about money. Uh, let's write a check and feed the horses, right. you know? I mean, Phil Rosenthal, you you do, you do you helped out with the pilot of, of Everybody Loves Raymond. Let's get everybody, like, if this is about money, right. we'll, we'll feed the horses. Yeah. But it was about so much more than that. It was the first time I had ever had a, uh, an experience with somebody with that kind of condition where you just see the light leave their eyes. Right. And he was a different guy. For and how it, long? <sighs> I would say it was a couple months, you know, and I'm busy, so I check in with him as much as I can. And then, and he was also very resent, uh, uh, resisting help, you know, he's that kind of guy. Yeah. And, uh, but I did see like, this is, this is more than this. This is chemical. Like something has happened. Um, but I don't know anything about that kind of stuff. Yeah. I, I mean, I have no, I, I, like with anybody that loses a friend, you can't talk to anybody who's going to say, I should have done this. I should have right. done that. Right. We should have got him in treatment. I mean, what do you, yeah. but, but in the, in the moment, and he's also the smartest guy I've ever met, mm -hmm. the smartest guy I've ever met who loves his wife and daughter and not in a million years. Do you think that this guy would take his own it life? But that it just goes to show you it wasn't him. Right. It wasn't him. Yeah. You know, and then I got a call in the middle of the night who was our shared agent at the time. And uh, it was just it was devastating. Just devastating. I'm sorry you had to go through that. Yeah. That I mean, it was really rough it was. You. Yeah, it was. I mean, look, it's rough. It's rough on on everybody that knew him and stuff. But it was just yeah, it was it was. But that's what I really learned from the whole experience with just what mental health can sometimes do. And I, I just never even thought about that as a possibility. And it's really, as somebody with depression, um, you, you can't help. Yeah. There's nothing. When I get down and I come out of it, I'll say to my friends, yeah, I just had a rough week. I was really depressed. Why didn't you call me? Because it would not have done anything. Yeah. It's just a disease that needs to just sit with itself. Sometimes you got to go down. You, sometimes you fight it. Sometimes you, it's like riding a wave. Sometimes you got to just let go and get tumbled a little bit and then come back up again. And to think that you could have done something is just faulty thinking. Yeah, and to even think like, oh, well, it's this. If we can fix this or it's this, yeah. what I learned ultimately was like it, was, it wasn't those things. I mean, they yeah. can contribute and trigger, I guess, but whatever it was that at that point in his life, it just clicked on yeah. or clicked off, the way ever, however we want to his look at it. His daughter was so beautiful singing at the funeral. Oh, she's so talented. Yeah. She And then uh, she just uh, she came and worked with us a little bit. We did an outside writer's room for this show that I'm doing, it, and uh, because I didn't want to do a Zoom room, so we just met in my backyard. Oh, and no she kidding. Came, yeah, it was great. And so, she helped write? No, she was a writer's assistant. She came oh, in and wow, took notes and pitched amazing. stories and stuff. And yeah, we would just be, we would just sit. People would bring their dogs to my backyard. Uh -huh. We'd work 
out there. My wife would like make lunch for everybody. We had no a blast. Shit. We're like, we're never riding indoors again. This oh, was, that's great. On Thursdays, we would leave whenever the gardener came. That's, yeah. That was like, or we'd have a <laughs> rain delay sometimes, but it was I'm awesome. I'm so fucking done with Zoom. Oh, you know, I, I hate it. You can't get any, I actually just, I sold a uh, game show this morning. Oh, for congratulations. Zoom. Yeah, so the game show now. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. The good thing about pitching on Zoom, though, I've noticed, I mean, I like being in a room, there's more energy and stuff, yeah. but I actually took out a project, um, uh, and, and, and we did it on Zoom, and ultimately it fell apart, but I'd like to be able to put like a, a whiteboard behind my laptop, because I've got this giant yeah. cheat sheet. Of like, you know, and it just seems like you're talking. So that was the only good thing about it that you could like kind of cheat. Yeah, a writer's room is all about the board. Yeah. You know, you literally, there's just the, usually the showrunner's up there with the, with the marker. That's all and I just, do. I just stand oh, by that board. Right. And we had those boards in my backyard. So we had them on, yeah. we'd roll them out into the wow. backyard and everything. Yeah. yeah. But I don't know. I, I've talked to people that do the Zoom writer's rooms. It sounds awful. Yeah. It sounds awful. Yeah. And you don't get the fun. Like, part of the fun of writer's room is the bullshitting. Is the, yeah. okay, all right, let's get to work now, but 20 minutes of just bullshitting. You're not doing that on Zoom. Yeah. It's like, we're here, let's work. Right, oh, right. I, I don't. I hope I never have to do it. Yeah. So the the show that, uh, that I just saw, Sprung. Yeah. It's your new show. And uh, was that done in a physical writer's room? No, no, that was the one we did on the uh, outside. Oh, we did that outside. We did that like last spring outside. And then we went and once we wrote them all, then I went to Pittsburgh and shot them all. But yeah, that was the one. We just had a small. Why did you shoot in Pittsburgh? Well, I wanted to shoot in Frostburg, Maryland, where I went to college because I kind of wanted to get a little money into that community. And I liked the look of it and everything. The problem was to shoot outside of a major city. It must have added like four or five million dollars. Yeah. Especially during COVID because you have to house everybody. Yeah. And even the carpenters have to be in the union. So you can't even hire local people. You know, they have to be in the specific union. No so shit. So then once I had my heart set on shooting on the East Coast, we looked at Pittsburgh. I drove around Pittsburgh and we're not in Pittsburgh proper, but we get 10, 15 minutes outside of Pittsburgh. And now everything looks like Frostburg, Maryland. It's kind right. of rust belty and whatever. And they got a ta- great tax incentive to shoot there. So we ended up shooting in Pittsburgh. That's great. Which was cool. I mean, you have to like... You can't bring all your crew, so it's a lot of new crew, and uh-huh. you're figuring some stuff out. But for the most part, it, it went pretty smooth. It was long. I directed all of them, so it was like 61 straight Did days. Did you really? How many episodes? 10 episodes. Whoa. 61 straight days. Just so days. people know, generally on a show, you do, in 10 episodes, one director might do three. Yeah, and and it's like you, you would like do one, and then you would be prepping for the next one, and you would do another one. But because we shot this like a movie and cross-boarded it, we could be shooting episodes 10, 3, 5, and 1 oh, all I in see. one day. Right. I can't just have a bench of directors waiting to like tag in and out. Right. So I I just, that's, I kind of so had to do them all. So you were the showrunner and the director. Yeah, and I wrote them all. And you wrote them all. Yeah, but I had a staff wow. that kind of helped out with the right. You know how that works with, the, you know, we, we, we would all break a story together in my backyard and then I would go away for a week and write the script, and then we'd come back and kind of like you know punch it up and work on it. Together. But there's something about because um, I got on the channel, I wanted to s- experience the channel that you're on, just Amazon so I could Freebie, yeah. Amazon Freebie, just because you know some people, some I have somebody on sometimes, and they have a show when it's on BET Plus or something, yeah. and I always make the effort to go, all right, how difficult is this yeah. to do? Yeah. Freebie, it takes about three seconds. It's you not hard one at thing, all. It downloads, and you get access to... I watched the first episode of All in the Family today. Yeah. They've got all kinds of yeah, stuff on there. Great. Look, the thing is, is there's commercials. But, you know, some people hate commercials. Some people are fine with it. Even like Hulu now. I think I have Hulu with commercials. And at least with Freebie, they are making an effort to have it be less commercials. Right. It's not going to be the same now, there was, flow from Progressive saying the same commercial 10 times yeah, in a row. I think there was two breaks and it was one commercial each. But, yeah. but um, I think the reason I bring it up is that uh, watching All in the Family and you realize like with a skeleton crew, with less cooks in the kitchen, you get a product. All in the Family, I fucking laughed out oh. loud five times during the first episode of All in the Family. It's great. It was a play. Yeah. It was a fucking... Simply shot. It was just a steady cam, following them from the living room to the dining room, back yeah. and forth. Many times you would go three minutes without the camera cutting. And they and they cheated. To, it was like a play. Yeah. 
Um, but it makes me think like when you have one person that's writing and directing and doing, it gets, you get an organic feel to the episode. And this show feels like uh, it is from the mind of one person. Oh, cool. It feels very organic. It's very funny. Um, holy shit, Martha Plimpton. Oh my God. Are you fucking kidding and me? And she, she, she wasn't the original person in that role. Oh, no we, kidding. We cast Ileana Douglas because Martha wasn't available. She was on this HBO show. Oh. And we cast Ileana Douglas, and three days in, I realized we needed to make a change. Okay. And so Garrett Dillahunt, the uh, lead of the show, who was on Raising Hope with Martha, I went to his trailer, and I go, should we call Martha? And he goes, absolutely. And so we called her. She was in London, and I said, uh, if we can work all this out and get you out of your HBO deal, which looked like we could at that point because the show had aired and it probably wasn't coming back. I said, could you be in Pittsburgh in three days and shoot? She's like, yeah, let's make it happen. That's amazing. And then the day before she flew in, she was getting on the plane, and she was like, uh, all right, I got the scripts. I thought she'd read them already. She's like, I got the scripts. Who am I playing? I'll read them on the plane. Oh, she said yes, sight unseen, oh, yeah, just because it was you. Yeah, because we we still remain friends and, and awesome. everything, and she was just like, no. I'm, I'm, and she'd already been like emailing me like, fuck you. You guys are doing a show without me. Fuck uh, you. I'm so mad. I'm like, you're yeah, not yeah, available. Yeah. But she was right, like joking right. and everything. So no, it was great. And then she came in and just crushed but she, it. But the thing is, is like, it's, it's you know, um, hillbillies. It's rednecks, whatever you want to call them. But yeah. she doesn't overplay it. There's a real human being underneath who happens to have a lot of characteristics of somebody that might, you know, live in in that world yeah exactly you know and it's like it's not like the south it's funny because my shows like i always like like to see how people like define the people on my shows because like on my yeah. name is Earl, people have said these people are rednecks i'm like no they're not rednecks they don't drive around with rebel flags and hunt right. and all this stuff they're white trash yeah yeah but they're not rednecks and then when i did raise no people like they're white trash i'm like no they have jobs they're just poor you know whatever yeah. but it's funny like uh and so yeah i would say well these are these are straight up criminals i mean the people on this show they're yeah. they're, they're criminals right so why do you think you choose that world to to write in so much? I You've think, probably been asked that a million times. Yeah, but that's I'm a, curious. I, I, the the answer is I just root for those people more. Like I like shows like Frasier and Thirty Rock and those shows. They're funny, but. I don't think their problems are really that real. They're more manufactured problems. Whereas, like, I always loved Roseanne. It was like, we got to yeah. pay the light bill. Right. Like, that's a problem I can get behind. The honeymooners, yeah. Yeah, you know, I always root for those people. I have more fun writing them. I try to write them in a way that I'm not making fun of them because I love them. And then even growing up in Virginia, I had friends on both sides of the track, right? I had friends that belonged to the country club. We didn't. We were somewhere in the middle, right? Yeah. I had friends that belonged to the country club. I'd go to their houses, hang out. But then I'd have friends that lived in the trailer park. Yeah. I love the trailer park, That was more park, fun, man. of That's course. where I wanted to yeah. be. Yeah. I mean, first of all, they all had nicer TVs than uh, us. How do they have nicer <laughs> TVs, you know? And then you open up a door to, like, one bedroom, and it's just weed growing everywhere. Yeah, and like it's BB the, guns. It's like and... a Tuesday at 11, and no yeah. one's at work. Yeah. The place is alive. Like, that's where I wanted to be. So I think I'm just drawn yeah, to that right. more. Well, you walked in and you showed me your Arizona for, yeah. you, for raising Arizona. Yeah, which is both is it's my favorite film of all my time. My favorite of all time. Yeah, absolutely my favorite movie of all time. And uh, yeah, I've been accused from stealing from them for quite some time, but that's fine. I'll take it. You know, I I just love their style and everything. The Coen Brothers. But what did uh, somebody famous said? Uh, Smart people borrow and geniuses steal. Yeah, or there something. you go. I yeah. what it was, All right, but, I'll take it. But no, you obviously are influenced by that, by those. It's it's the stakes. It's what you said. It's when you know, it's when you got nothing, and and so and 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 it informs the the actors. If you can get real characters playing high stakes like that. You know, like the your central. What's the main guy's name? Garrett Dillahunt. Yeah. I mean, he's a real actor. Oh yeah, he's amazing. I mean, he does drama, comedy, everything. Yeah. If you can get people that are plain, quirky, odd characters, but play them real, playing it real, and just lean back into the comedy instead of just being in your face with it. Yeah. I hate that. As long as they can just be real, they're just you believe it, you love it. Right. Right. Yeah. So. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, Joey Diaz because yeah. he's a very dear friend of mine, oh. and you've you he used to put him on Earl as yeah, well. Yeah, he right? was on Earl. He he did uh, he did a couple things on Earl when Earl was in prison. I keep putting Joey back in prison. Yeah. I feel bad about that, <laughs> but he, he he does it so well. And then he did an episode for me of a show called The Guest Book, which he was hysterical in. Um, 
he's just such a fun presence, you know. I've just been a fan of him for a while, and yeah. I get to go on his podcast. Up that no, he's he's the best. He's yeah. the best. And then I called him to do this, and he hadn't done anything in a while, right? No, you he's know? been laying low in Jersey, yeah. laying very low. And then he was like, uh, "All right, Garcia, I'll do it. I'll bring Mercy down. We're gonna go to Hershey Park. I'm bringing the wife." I need two hotel rooms. I go, whatever you need, you get, buddy. You get whatever you need. And I even tell That's like great. the crew, I'm like, listen, Joey's coming. Make sure Joey is comfortable. Make sure he's doing me a favor for coming yeah. here. You treat him better than anybody else on this. You treat yeah. him right. You yeah. Know? And but he came in and we had, we had a great time. He's in two episodes and uh, we shot them all in in one day. And now he's that's the kind of thing where. Um, you realize how important casting is and when you can get somebody who brings something to it that uh, Joey Diaz is a whole package. You're not going to get that anywhere else. Yeah. You're not going to find a Joey Diaz. You're getting Diaz. all the options. Yeah. yeah. Everything. Yeah. He comes in loaded. Yeah. And and um, I'm surprised he hasn't gotten bigger stuff. I, I think that the uh, Sopranos movie, I don't know that that really registered with people yeah as much as it, I was it, hoping it, it would have been better yeah if it got a little bit more splash right because he was yeah. really good in he that too really i think he also that. hates to audition like i've been a part yeah. of shows where i wasn't it wasn't really my show and he's come in to audition and then he sees me and he lights up you know i was just like supervising and yeah but he doesn't i don't think he likes that process no. at all no. you know you kind of just need to be like yeah we're writing this for joey and he's going right. to come in and we're going to make him comfortable and he's going to give us a natural performance because we've written this for him, and he's and he's comfortable with it. He's on and 100 he's, milligrams of gummy, so oh make my sure he's God. comfortable. Yeah, exactly. Jesus, <laughs> exactly. You got to time it out. You got to time the day out, right? It's inhuman it's, the amount of of weed he can put in his system. It's it's. I don't. I don't. Two hundred milligrams. He'll I take. think he told me he slowed down some, but like it is unreal but he enjoys apparently he enjoys i was talking to someone about this he enjoys the panic like he enjoys the roller coaster ride which is something i don't understand yeah i know some people it's like yeah this is an adrenaline i'm whoo i got through it but yeah i don't get it but he seems to be you know yeah. he seems to be cool with it yeah 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 he's the best um and all right so going back to the show what i like about it is because jet apatow did a movie about um a bunch of people that were trapped in a hotel making a movie okay. during the pandemic. All right, and he did it in a in a in a clever way that really paid off. But what I liked about yours is you capture like the first two weeks of the pandemic. Yeah, and I forgot the shit, the thing about not touching your face. <laughs> And how we all, so then you'd use your shirt, but then it's like, and you're like, okay, I'm good now with my shirt. No, now your shirt has yeah, it yeah, on it. Like yeah. you wear, you want to wear gloves? Great. You got to take the gloves off with your hands. Yeah. And we're washing the groceries and just all that crazy stuff. Oh my God. Well, I wrote it right at the beginning of the pandemic, which was kind of tough to, the first episode I wrote like around March or somewhere around there, like early. Yeah. And right whenever they started letting prisoners out, I was like, oh, this could be a good idea. Yeah. You know, I could, yeah. I could tap into this. And so a lot of the stuff was kind of fresh in my mind, but also kind of by design, we set it in those first few weeks because you can have a little fun with how naive we were, right? Because it's it's a serious subject. I mean, I know people that have died from this thing. Sure. I don't want to make right, light right, of a right. pandemic just for my own comedy. But when you can look back and go, okay, it was the early time. People, do we wear masks? Do we not wear masks? People are using different things for masks because they can't get masks. <laughs> the party hat. Yeah, the party hat. I think we have someone in a scuba thing <laughs> yeah, in the background yeah. at one point right. that they're wearing, like a snorkel. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so that was kind of by design because he didn't want it to like push into like just the dog days of just like, oh god this right. sucks you know whatever so yeah that was kind of by design and and we had some fun with it we even had to go back through the scripts at one point and go let's just make sure we have enough little nods to covid because then you start right. telling the story and you're like are we ignoring covid at this point right. so it's a happy you know got to find the happy medium i can't wait to see more episodes it's uh it, when does it premiere uh friday uh, uh august 19th august 19th. so yeah it'll be it'll be out august 19th and they're going to do two episodes a week for five weeks. That's okay. how they're that's how they're releasing it. Right. Yeah. And then what are you doing now? So you wait to see how that goes. You wait to see how it goes. I mean, it, yeah, I'm just relaxing, man. You I know. love your life, man, because you started young. You worked your ass off during a writer's strike. We had a writer's strike in 89? No, what were 2007, 2007 was the one I was involved in, yeah. And I read on Wikipedia that you were working at a Burger King? I did, yeah. As a, as a 
janitor yeah well i was a cashier slash janitor yeah 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 Whoa. i was running earl at the time it was i was running my name as earl and then that pandemic well it was because like years ago i was at a roy rogers you remember those fast food places of roy rogers they're not a lot of, around anymore and it's my favorite favorite fast food place um other than burger they King, had the roast course. beef yeah they had the roast beef they had like the fries that would come in like a holster you could put it on your belt you can actually thread it through your belt and eat <laughs> fries through a holster which i do when i go i'm like let's get the full experience yeah and i was watching the people behind the counter and i was doing yes dear at the time i was like god oh, they're working so hard and i'd have a hard job my you know i worked for my uncle's lawn business mowing lawns i pumped gas you know i had i had real hard jobs growing up and i'm like i wonder if i could still do it and I thought to myself, it would be a fun like book to write, like do a different job every 30 days and then write about it, hopefully be funny about it, meet the people I'm working with. And then as a game show element, give the person, give one person that I worked with $10,000 and then bolt out. Right. So when you're reading it, it'd be fun. Right. Yeah. And then I didn't do it because I was always working. And then I saw like 30 days with Morgan Spurlacher and undercover yeah, boss and all these that. things that, that were kind of like yeah. similar. And I'm like, but then the pandemic, I mean, the uh, strike hit and I'm like, let me go try this. Let yeah. me just try it just for the heck of it. So I went to a Burger King, got hired, worked there for about a month. And then at the end of it, I did give like somebody 40 money. 40 hour weeks? No. I couldn't, I couldn't tell my kids that dad can finally be around you, but he's going to go spend his yeah. time at Burger King. Yeah. So I made up a lie to the manager. I had to explain my address, right? Because it was on my driver's license. And I live in a, I live near the Kardashians. <laughs> so it's like, I mean, it's like, it's like you have to explain yeah. this. So I said I lived with a family and I helped take care of their kids. And so I could only work from like nine to like two yeah. while they're in school and not weekends. So that was like my lie. So that's 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 the shift I pulled, you know, and I did that. And I worked for about a month and I got to know everybody and I did end up giving somebody the money just you because did. I wanted to follow through on the whole thing. She's still a good friend of mine. She was the manager. Um, yeah. Burger King found out about it. they gave me a card that gets free Burger King for the rest of my life. Get out of yeah, here. I got a, I got like a golden Burger King card. How often have you used it? I don't use it a ton. <laughs> I don't use it as much as I should. But when I do use it, I'm like Oprah in there because anybody yeah. in line, I'm like, what do you want? Everybody, I got uh, this. This is on me. Amazing. It's so fun. You feel it, like, and people are confused. They're like, yeah. Some people are like, no, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. You know, I get my own. You know, but yeah, it's it's a so blast. So what was, what was it like? I mean, I'm I've I've never worked in a fast food restaurant. Is it? I hadn't either. It was fast. Is there camaraderie? There's some camaraderie now. There was a bit of a language barrier because a lot of the employees only spoke Burger King English. Mm -hmm. And then I learned Burger King Spanish, uh. you know, but it's only the things you need to know, What's right? What's Burger King Spanish? Well, just like hamburguesa and yeah. this and maybe, and I've forgotten most of it now, uh -huh. you know, but it's, but there is camaraderie. And actually towards the end, like on my last day, the guys were joking with me and they were making me do the the drive through. And, and, and we finally actually my last day is when I felt like I really broke through and became buddies with people. But it's hard work. You know, yeah. I mean, it's hard work. I, it was easy for me because it was there was no pressure. Yeah. And it was the first time in my life I had a job where like I love I'll just go wipe down the tables for 20 minutes and think mm -hmm. about nothing. Yeah. And so for me, where and this sounds stupid to say, it was like easy and a luxury and a little bit of a, you know, I'm there as a goof. I'm yeah. writing a book. And even my manager at some point, I was like, uh, she goes, oh, I was telling so and so the other day. This is after I, you know much after I quit and she goes oh and I told him you know Greg would be Greg wouldn't be doing that Greg would find something to do you gotta be and I'm like don't say that yeah. that guy has two jobs yeah, he has right. two jobs he leaves there and he drives Domino's uh -huh. Pizza all night Greg was there on a goof Greg yeah. is not to be used as, a, as an Greg's example Greg's in his pool after work yeah exactly yeah. Greg's, Greg's not Greg framed the paycheck yeah <laughs> he didn't cash it you know so it's like so. But but the hard work and the people were great and I was just amazed at how clean it was yeah and and had the attention to detail and it, I was I was impressed I was really impressed with how that one that one store at least was was run. I hope that uh, I mean I know that most jobs my kids are both in college and they both got uh, summer jobs and you know it took them three hours to go find a job. Yeah. Everybody is hiring. Yeah. And I hope that in the fast food restaurants that translates to them getting better wages because. It used to be, I mean, it was pretty criminal. What, yeah, what were they wasn't. paying you it, when you- I, I don't remember, but it was not good. Yeah. I mean, I remember like 
I certainly remember going out to dinner on the night I got my paycheck, and the dinner was more than the paycheck. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, and, and we weren't at someplace super fancy or anything, yeah. but no, yeah, hopefully the wages are getting better, and, and yeah, I'm in the same situation with kids out there, you know, getting getting those jobs and stuff, and working at gym behind the counter, and my son yeah. just started working for the Boys and Girls Club of Malibu. And, oh, really? Yeah, 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 he just, he just started working down there, and because uh, he, he just graduated from Oregon. Oh no shit! Yeah, yeah he's a just, duck. Yeah, he's they would a duck. just won the championships. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was yeah, he yeah. there? Uh, he went to the Rose Bowl the time that they two years ago or something when they went to the Rose Bowl and won. Uh, he went to that one, and uh-huh. we had like thirty kids staying at my house. Really? And it was nuts. Yeah, it was nuts, but it was fun. I got a van. I'm driving them all there with a big old passenger van, and that's awesome. We had a good time. Wow. Yeah, for sure. And so he's graduated. What's his degree? He's graduated. He's a journalism he had journalism degree, and this is just like his first. He so you goes, got your kids are journalism and theater degrees. Yeah, and then yeah. I. Got a, Good thing I, you're making money. I know, right? And then I got a younger one who's uh, <laughs> he's at this hippie boarding school, which he loves, uh-huh. which he loves. But uh, yeah, so we're empty nesters, like you. We're we're you know we're figuring it all out. What's next? Are you traveling? You can doing you some wife? traveling, doing some traveling, but um, but still, my my youngest son, we still go visit him a lot, you know. So he's not too far away, so we don't travel too much. But we're just starting to kick that in it's our first year of being empty nesters but we'll be like playing gin and eating hard candy and listening to music at like seven o'clock at night and i'm like i'm fine with this i feel 80 but i'm fine with it i'm finding that um i smoke more pot my wife drinks more since we've been empty empty yeah nesters. that can happen for yeah. sure that can happen for yeah. sure and you know but we're trying to stay busy and you know we find little activities to do and especially now while i have some downtime it's great you but they're watch- all here for the summer now. They're all here. Do you can you enjoy watching TV, or do you find as somebody who creates it that you're deconstructing it and not? I love watching TV. I don't watch a ton of comedies because those I think I will deconstruct more. And but I mean the upper echelon of comedies like the uh, Barry and Vice. Curb Your Enthusiasm. Um, yeah. And uh, um, what was the other one I was thinking? Atlanta, like those, yeah. like high maintenance, even like those, like outside of the box ones. They're yeah. so good. Yeah. Then I can watch those. But mostly, I, I, I watch a ton of dramas. But yeah, I consume a ton of TV. I love it. I Do love you watch it. CBS multi camera shows. I don't watch anything on network. Yeah. I, the only thing I watch on network is Survivor because we've watched Survivor as a family our whole lives. And my littlest one is obsessed with it. And then I end up hiring a guy that won it to put on a show. And that turned into like Jeff Probst coming to our house for like this party and the kids losing their minds. No shit. And he's like a great guy. So like yeah. that Survivor and Amazing Race are the only two network and sports. Those are the only things I watch on networks anymore. Right. Right. Yeah. And I don't know why it is. I think after years of doing network sitcoms, it's like, yeah, I get it. I know what it is. And yeah. even if they're great, like I, I just don't seem to watch like Billy Gardell's show is fantastic. I watched it on a plane. I didn't, I, he's a friend and I'm like, I haven't seen a show. I watched like five episodes on a plane. I'm like, yeah. this is a really well done With sitcom. the worst, worst title in sitcom history. Yeah, Bob loves Abba show. Have you seen Billy lately, by the way? No, has he lost weight? Oh, buddy, he's lost weight. No shit. It's unbelievable. Wow. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I'll show you a picture. Well, later. I always thought of him as like a Jackie Gleason or a Kevin James. Like, even when they're fat, they still seem athletic and kind of agile. Yeah, right? They really wear it. They really wear it well. But, uh, but I mean, I'm sure people that watch his show will see that this transformation that he's made. And Jackie Gleason's a perfect example, too, because not only does he do a great Jackie Gleason, but like... You see his presence on stage. He just yeah. murders. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just he does. murders. It's he just does. this force. That voice comes out of that body. Is he still doing stand up? I, I don't think he's doing a lot of stand up these mm. days. No, I think he's kind of really slowing down. He told me he goes Garcia. He goes once this show's over, I'm getting a, I'm getting a, uh, I'm taking my cell phone. I'm throwing it in the ocean, and I'm getting a phone with a 15 foot cord. That's it. <laughs> you know, he says I'm, I'm out. I'm out. So I think he's looking forward to retiring. Well, he's got retirement money now. He does now, Holy buddy. Sh- oh, what do you think boy. that guy makes an episode? Oh, I don't know. I it's got it. You know, it it depends on the stuff. But like, you know, you're you're probably making a couple hundred grand an couple episode. Hundred grand I mean, episode times twenty two, and it's a multi cam. Yeah. You come in there, you work 
four days a week, yep. half a day. Yeah. For actors, it's the most amazing thing and whatsoever. You are pampered. You've got oh. a staff of writers trying to make everything you say funny. Yeah, the writers. We're there all night. We're yep. doing rewrites after every mm -hmm. run through. We're getting notes, and they're walking out of there at two o'clock on a Wednesday, yeah. going, "All right, send me the script, yeah. suckers." Yeah, the last sitcom I did, it was it was a great cast, and it was Will Arnett and Sean Hayes and J.B. Smooth and oh, uh, the Millers. Yeah, it was yeah, called. I like yeah. the Millers. I yeah, know that it, was you. It, it only lasted great. like a season and yeah. a half, but but man, just the smile on Will Arnett's face yeah. of just like this is amazing. Right, He's right, just right. loving the schedule. Yeah, so, yeah, that's yeah. the gig. You can but, get it as an actor. But do you prefer uh, multi camera as a writer? No. Uh, I vastly prefer a single camera. You think you're done with multi-camera? Uh, you know, look, I mean, if the right thing comes along, like you said, All in the Family was amazing, you know? Yeah. And I think Gerard Carmichael did a good job with his multi-camera to get right. some of that same feel to it as well. If the right thing came along, I'll never say never, but I really do enjoy single camera. I enjoy the writing process better because you write it, you're happy with it, you get a few notes, you do a table read, and that's it. Yeah. You're not doing run-throughs all week long. You're not changing things dramatically all week long. It's 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 a hassle. Right. That's a pain. And then also just I've really started to enjoy directing and the visual sense of everything. And and I and I'd have a hard time going back to just filming a play because I'd feel like oh, I want to be doing more with the camera. Yeah. I want so right now I think single camera is my thing. But you know you never know. It's still a very viable you know. Uh, art form that sure. you know and it's ch way cheaper to yeah. make for the studio and so. it's also as a writer it's so much fun to fly in alt lines that is fun i mean up. i mean and the night and then you have an audience because yeah. you never have an audience right. with, with with a single camera so you're just like hopefully people will laugh at this yeah you know you can't even laugh out loud during the takes people have to stifle their laughter whereas like sitcoms you know and the last the other thing too is like i did the millers and even though it didn't last for more than a season and a half this cast was amazing Jimmy Burroughs was the director for wow. all of them. So I got to work with Jimmy. That's amazing. So it's like, maybe I just finish, you know, not, not most people wouldn't consider it on top, but I would consider it on top considering who I worked with. Now, Jim Burroughs, who is without doubt the most successful TV director in history. Um, yeah. What is it working with him that sets him apart? Like, what did you learn from him? Well, I mean, look, just obviously there's the wisdom and the talent and the experience that nobody else has. He's been in every situation at any time. I mean, time. Taxi oh, and... Cheers. Yeah. He started on the Mary Tyler Moore show. Right. He's directed every pilot that's gone into syndication and made a ton of money that there is. Right. And by the way, I, I, I'm talking a lot about finances on this show, but I think it's, you know, you're we're both, you know, uh, have kind of access to this information yeah. i think it's interesting information um a director who directs a pilot for a tv series never has to work a day again for that series and will get paid every a time the episode airs a royalty and then on top of that they get a piece of the show so when it sells into syndication they get they get a piece of that so you're which talking, is a ton of money if it's syndicated. Yeah. so you're talking about a guy who directed the pilot for big bang theory i believe friends <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. I mean, this is what you get one of those shows and you're set for life. Yeah. He has a piece in 20 of those shows. Right. And, and he, every season he'll direct three pilots. Yeah, because he's the man to get. And he's still doing it at yeah. 80 years old. I think he's probably 80 years old. He's still doing it. And But to get back to your question, it's the calming force that he is. Yeah. You know, and just like he will... He, he will defend you to the next. He's there to help the writer. Yeah. He really is. And there's no ego involved. And he said this to me, and I found out he says this to everybody when he first met me. He goes, look, 50% of what I say is genius. 50% of it is shit. It's your job <laughs> to figure it out, baby. You know? And, and, and he's just, and I asked him, I'm like, why do you still work? Why do you still work? And he's like, so I can enjoy my vacations. You know? Oh, interesting. And, and I think also there has to be a part of him that loves being Jimmy Burroughs. If he just goes yeah. and plays golf all the time, he's just another old white guy right, right, hitting right. the ball around. This guy walks onto a lot. It's royalty. Yeah. And he's just so sweet, no ego whatsoever. Uh -huh. um, we actually, the two of us went to... Um, Vegas together to see Gardell perform. No shit. Yeah, we he he goes because I told. Jet? Yeah, he, he he took care of the whole thing, mm -hmm. right? So like I remember we we're on set and I go I'm gonna go see Billy, 
uh, perform? And he goes, uh, well, we can. We'll go together. And I'm like, all right, sure. He goes, just to meet me at the airport, blah, blah, blah. And we fly, and I end up playing craps with him. And just, it's like, this is amazing. That's amazing. The sweetest guy. Yeah. The sweetest guy. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Did he start in theater, or was he always Yeah, he's, well, his father, Abe Burroughs, wrote Guys and Dolls and was like a theater legend. Right, so he grew up. Thought. I just read his book, actually. Uh-huh. Or I listened to it. Um, and I told him, I said, I listened to your book because it was like having a conversation with you, but you wouldn't shut up. You wouldn't let me get a word <laughs> in edgewise. But, uh, but his father, Abe Burroughs, was a legend. And so I think he was a little resistant to go into theater because he's in his dad's shadow. Yeah. But he did do some theater. And then when he was doing theater... I think he worked with Mary Tyler Moore, and then that's how he got his first break to get a directing gig on Mary Tyler Moore. And then he just took off as a as a TV director and became the guy, you know. It's just uncanny when you think about the quality of those shows. Taxi, Cheers, Mary Tyler Moore. I mean, they're just on another level. Yeah, and it's weird to, when you think about them. You you kind of wonder, and I don't have the answer to this. And if anybody should, I should because I've done it but like why can't we get back to that Mm -hmm. like is the like i I just don't i can't put my finger on why we can't get back to that um and you do you know you get close but like when you think about it like raymond like when was the last like breakout just kind of like classic feeling classic sitcom Mm -hmm. you know and maybe just maybe because there's just so much stuff on right now that they are out there, but they're just not getting as much attention because you don't get the audience you get anymore. Right. But there is something about those old shows. There was There's such... something different. Well, I think, you know, the networks are so hell-bent on putting heart into sitcoms, and those shows had tremendous heart, but somehow it felt more organic. Now I feel manipulated heart when I watch yeah. sitcoms. It doesn't feel... Um, because I don't, I think what they don't realize is that a character like Archie Bunker, who is just a curmudgeon and he's mean and he's racist, but there was a moment in the, in the pilot where Edith says something, Edith starts to cry because of a Hallmark card that he didn't even buy for her. Somebody else bought it and she just read the inscription and was so moved because she hadn't gotten a card in 10 years that she cried and she walked away, and there's a shot of Archie looking at her after he calling her a dingbat and a nitwit and all this. There's a shot of his face looking at her that shows that there is nothing on the planet that means more to her than her. Yeah, and, and it humanized him. Yeah. And, it gave him, and that's the thing about him, and I think some char- some people forget this when they're creating characters, is to give people levels, right? right. And And you'll get this ensemble cast of like, seven people and I'm always telling people make it four right. you know because if you get seven people that character that one sixth seventh character all they're going to become is the same thing every time you don't have time to get yeah. to, 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 to delve into them or you're just going to be confusing audiences because you don't have time to show all the layers right Right. so it's like that just becomes the snarky guy and that's right. it he's the snarky guy we never learn more about him like Jay, I remember Jamie Presley on My Name is Earl it was about four or five episodes in I was like okay we need to we need to break a story where we see the heart of this woman because mm-hmm. she's just been the mean ex-wife trying to kill him, which has been great up until yeah. this point. But now we need we need to see her cry. Right. We need to see what makes her human. And then we did that. And just to so to find those levels like Archie had. Yeah. You know, I think is Louis it, De Palma had. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Is because the, they're surprising. And right. it's fun to maybe sometimes learn those things a little later on. I remember like. The one note yeah, you they gotta for, earn. You gotta earn yeah, it. Yeah, you gotta earn it because sometimes you get notes from in the pilot stage from people, and they're like, "Well, where did he go to school? What does he do for uh, a living? What does he do?" For? And I'm like, "That's not interesting. Like, yeah. I'm way more interesting. I'm more, more interested. Like, if I'd hung out with you for like a year and a half, and then all of a sudden you tell me, well, you know, well, back when I was in Afghanistan, what? Yeah. You were in Afghanistan. Like, if you right. told me that on day one, I'd be like, okay, yeah, that's a fact about right. you. But now I've gotten to know you, and then there's a surprising thing about yeah. you. I'm like leaning forward. I want to learn about it more." Do you think about that stuff when you're creating a show? Do you plant landmines down the road for characters? Sometimes. Sometimes you just kind of organically find it later. You know, you're not sure. I mean, sometimes, like, 
sometimes there'll be a, like a joke in the room. On Earl, there was a character named Crab Man, and somebody just pitched a joke that he says something, a throwaway. He says, oh, when I was in witness protection. And we thought it was funny. Just like throw that little thing out there. But then it became his whole storyline for like episodes season three right, and right. four because yeah. it's like, so then it's just a joke that opens it up for yeah. it. And other times you'll you'll kind of get to know the actor and you'll see what their strengths are and how they respond with other actors. And then you use that as a guide to kind of like fill them out a little bit more too yeah a show is a living breathing organism and you have to pay attention to it and see what's see what's working and see what's growing yeah, and absolutely you yeah. can't be you can't be dug in on any one thing by by any means you have to just let it see like where it goes yeah um do you watch uh, always sunny in philadelphia yeah i dig it i mean i haven't seen but all of them that show has been so on so long well in the later seasons one of the characters comes out as gay but yeah. so slowly like yeah. over three seasons he comes out as gay <laughs> and it's great and it's when you have a show like that that you know is just going to keep going and going because mm -hmm. it's so successful and it's so funny and it's so you cheap can do to that. shoot They're it's just so keep, cheap right. to shoot they've got that thing dialed yeah. in i mean how they cross shoot and just like mm -hmm. just they must bang those out so quick and they're all so talented and you can tell too that they just all love each other yeah. which is great because you feel like you're part of the crew yeah when you have the luxury to be like yeah we're going to spoon this out over three years because yeah. we know we're going to be picked up that's awesome yeah it's great um yeah i just played golf with uh charlie daly oh, okay yeah he's a good guy and his phone rang and it was one of the other stars of the show they really are like best friends yeah i had a little bit of involvement with rob once he called me about that's who called him yeah yeah rob. he called me for advice about something a while ago and we chatted for a long, long time and he was a super nice guy yeah, yeah i'm so happy for those guys yeah yeah to to shoot something on your own like that on a shoestring no budget at all and then to go out and sell it and it turns into this that's every actor slash writer's dream right, you right. know and now people have even better tools to go out and shoot sure. their own stuff and they they have places to put it i mean there was no youtube when this guys did it they mm -hmm. just shot it in on a vhs probably and sent it around right, to people right and and so what a what a dream come true you know yeah it's uh it's definitely a tale of like uh anything's possible and they they he was even telling me when we played golf as like uh He's like, yeah. When they gave him Danny, De the the network insisted on Danny DeVito as as they wanted a star on yeah, the show because yeah. they weren't going to put it on the air without a star. It was black and white. You either hire him or you. Don't. And they fought it. They yeah. didn't want the big name. They yeah. wanted it to feel Just like keep it small. Yeah, yeah. But and then he's hilarious. He's hilarious. So funny. Yeah, great. All right. Well, listen. Um, I can't I can't recommend it enough. Sprung is oh, a thanks. It's a really uh, it's four characters, just like you said, four tower, and you get to know them. You start to see so much unfold out of each of them throughout it. There's laugh out loud scenes, and it's the it's the kind of pilot that makes you go like, "Oh, I need to see all these episodes." Oh, fantastic! Yeah, yeah I'm hoping people check it out. We're proud of it for sure. And uh, and again, it's on Freevee. Yeah, Amazon Freevee. So yeah, you can either download the Freevee app on Roku or Apple TV or any of those things. Or you can also access it through Amazon Prime uh, if you want to go that way. And um, and there's an AMC Pacer in it, 1976 that's AMC mine. Pacer. Yeah, that's mine. No. Yeah, it's still back in Pittsburgh, but yeah, that's mine. And it was great because as we shot with it, it had a cracked windshield. It needed, uh -huh. the, and so every day they'd fix it up even more and more for me. Yeah, yeah, I've got a, a AMC Pacer, a, a ran, Ford Ranchero, and a Smoking the Bandit Trans Am. You so, do? Yeah. Is that a '78? '77. Uh -huh. And it was signed by Bert right by the stick shift. No shit. And then a fucking detailer cleaned the car oh, no. and scrubbed oh, it off my God. if you can believe it <laughs> and then they got in touch with Bert my agent got in touch with Bert's agent and Bert, he called Bert and told him what happened and he goes oh I had such fun with Greg shooting that show I'm back in LA in October to shoot Quentin Tarantino's movie tell him to bring it I'll sign him oh, again three great. weeks before he gets there he dies oh no yeah <laughs> Yeah. So, anyway. Well, I thought you were going to see you crash the car, so that's good news. No, car's good. Car's All right, well, good. listen, thanks for coming on, man. Thank Love you. This you. was a lot of fun. All right, good. All right.